Two things are true about mixing. One, mixing is really all about solving problems. You solve all the problems, your mix is good. Thing two, the simpler solution is almost always the better solution. If you've got a problem in a mix and you think, okay, I've, first of all, get good at identifying the problem. That's the first step. Don't start moving knobs until you've identified what it is you're trying to fix or solve or improve. Then when you do, think through what what are my possible tools that I could use to fix this? Because there's a, there's a good chance there are five different ways to fix the problem you're facing. Choose the simplest one. What do I mean by simplest? The one that requires the fewest components, the fewest parts, the fewest moves. So for example, if I've got something that sounds muddy, I have a couple of options. I could cut the 200 hertz muddiness, or I could boost the high frequencies and then maybe boost the lows down below 200. And the net result is those 200 frequencies are now down compared to everything else. So the net sounding result is roughly the same. One of those solutions took two moves. The other one took one move. I'll take the one move for 200, please, um, Alec. Okay, so that's a simple idea, but th there's... The blessing and the curse of having such a deep tool like Studio One at our disposal is we can concoct these crazy, complicated solutions to problems that A, may not work, and they just they don't actually solve the problem, they make it worse. Or B, they take so much time that you kind of exhaust yourself because every simple problem that comes along, you you automatically go to the most complicated way to do it. We have really cool, we have a lot of side chaining inside of Studio One. That's cool. Side chaining probably isn't the answer to most of the problems you're facing, though. It's a cool tool, it's useful in a certain situation, but I found the simpler solution is always better. So here's a real life example. This is a song, a uh, single that I'm working on for my band. I've, I'm, I'm on mix two. I think it might be done. I'm waiting to hear back from the boys. But there was there was an issue with the guitar track on this. So this this section I'm gonna play for you. I'm just gonna play you the instruments. The vocal is muted. It's uh it's drums, bass, and then two electric guitars. That's it. And the problem was it's a we're playing like a down out chicka 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 down out just palm muted stuff. And the drummer who wrote most of the song was telling me, man, I want, I don't want you to just go down out and then just let me play. Like I, I want you like palm muting in there. I want it to feel like a little bit chaotic, a lot of energy happening. Um, so I did, and I had a really aggressive tone. I'm using the the Tone Master Pro, the Tangerine model cranked. So it's it's a little bit out of control in a fun way. But um, the problem is the palm mutes end up being feeling almost louder than when I'm playing. Let me play you just the guitar part real quick to give you an idea. It's very, very aggressive. Here's what it sounds like with drums and bass. Oh, I love this song so much. So, <laughs> the uh, goosebumps alert. Anyway, the so the problem here, and what I thought actually during the tracking session was, I'm probably going to go in and automate these down later, right? I've got actually, actually have some automation on this. So these two guitars right here are feeding into this electric guitar rhythm bus, so that I can do some volume automation and EQ them together and have one volume fader for each. But my initial thought was either using clip gain or volume automation, I'm probably going to do this number where like each in between section, I'm going to do something like this. That was way too much. They almost disappeared. And that's a more complicated solution because I got to go do that every single time this happens. And this happens during the intro, during the verses. Uh, I think it happens over here. In this verse, it happens here after the solo, I think. And it happens on the outro too. It's a lot of places where I'm going to have to go do that. And I'm not even sure that's the right solution. Is it a solution? Potentially. Is it the right solution? I don't think so. You probably already guessed that, didn't you? So let's listen again. What is the real problem here? Let's play it again. <music> Two. 
to me, it's just there's a little too much of the chirka chirka chirka, the bow out. The hits feel real good. That just feels great. Just real good. The bass, he's slapping. I'm hitting it hard. It feels good. The drums, of course, let's hear the drums. You get a turn. Um, he's just going ham. The it's just the in between where I felt like something was missing, and so I start. I thought about it before. I you know what the first idea I had just to show our propensity towards complicated solutions is universal. We're all going to do it once you learn how to do something complicated. It's probably human nature to want to go do that on as anywhere you can see it. So the first idea I had was what about upwards compression, which is. Don't go, don't go Google it. Just real quickly. If if typical compression is at a four to one ratio, it's turning down things that go above the threshold. There are some compressors, if you set them with a negative ratio, so minus four to one, then it does the exact opposite. When the sound goes above the threshold, it turns it up. And then below the threshold, it keeps it at its current volume. Similar to the way a gate works, similar to the way an expander works, And I actually attempted, I actually tried the expander in this, tried the gate, um, found a compressor. Actually, the the multiband compressor in Studio One allows you to go a negative ratio. Started messing with that. The idea being, have these, because they're quieter, have them be even quieter. And then when the sound crosses the threshold into the big jugger jugger, it it turns them up. And then the quieter ones stay quiet. Complicated, right? Um, And it ended up being... A, it was it was the difference in volume isn't enough for the compressor to really tell. Um, so then I started just listening to the guitar and thinking, what is it about the tone between these two? Is there a difference in tone? And the answer is yes. Can you hear it? What's the difference between the big old jigger 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 and the chugga chugga, the palm mutes and the full chords? Can you hear it? Okay, so the difference, I'll tell you in case you didn't guess it yourself, is there is more thickness in the palm mute part. When I'm full on playing, in case you didn't know, the way a guitar amp works, the the gain sound that we like about guitars is kind of a form of compression, right? That's why you can play a note and it holds out forever with the gain turned up versus when it's really clean. It doesn't hold out as long. Why? Because that gain is compressing. Our British friends use that term compressing and over compression and overdrive almost interchangeably. And it's really smart because the gain of an amp is a type of compressing. The way it's able to get that distortion is it's pushing that signal up and then it can't get any louder. So it starts to squish it down and all these cool, lovely distorted things happen. So that said, one of the things that happens when you when you overdrive something too much or you over compress something is the low frequencies tend to get pushed down um, and you tend to just hear the higher stuff. So right here, this guitar part... That sounds pretty pretty bright. It's mostly just upper mids, right? Which works for the mix. Um, but then this section where the guitar is starting and stopping and isn't playing all the high frequency stuff, it's just mainly palm muting, it gets a lot thicker. Right? You don't hear that when I'm playing full on. Once I start digging in and that kind of quote unquote compressor of the amp is clamped down, all those low frequencies are pushed so far down we don't hear them as much because the the star of the show is all the harmonics and the overdrive that's happening. So that was the aha moment for me is to realize really what's happening is there's a thickness here that isn't present everywhere else. And so what tools do I have to deal with thickness in a certain frequency? You guessed it, the boring old EQ. EQ is delightful. EQ solves most problems you're going to face. So what did I do? I put an EQ on this rhythm guitar bus. I found the frequency where the muddiness was happening, which was 186, by the way. Um, And then I just turned it down. So just so you know, this is what that muddy range sounds like. Just a whoop, 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 whoop. That's not delightful. Um, another way of listening to it is like this. Mm-hmm. 
So it's not even do it. There's not even much of that frequency there once I dig in, but on the palm mutes. So all I did was just pull that down about 6 dB. Listen to it now. I'm going to turn it off. Listen to the difference. The, the full on doesn't change tone wise almost at all, but the palm mute part gets a lot thinner and doesn't have that woo, woo, woo sound that it had before. Let's listen to it. Isn't that wild? Let me uh, just to just to hammer the point home in case you didn't hear it. You'll need some listening device that has some low frequencies to it, but you could probably hear this on a phone if I had to guess. Let me just turn it on and off so you can hear it while we loop over this section. So the net result is essentially what we did is we made the palm mute sections a little bit quieter and a little less thick and a little less annoying. I put this EQ on, and by the way, it doesn't really affect the tone of the rest of the guitars. Not enough to where we'd hear it in the mix, but when I did this and played it back, suddenly this section with the palm mutes just sat right down where I wanted it to sit without volume automation, without some weird reverse compression thing, without some other going in and clip gaining every single section. Just that one EQ solved that problem. Here's what it sounds like. And now it's it's got enough space for that vocal to sit on top of it without Con those what, what frequencies competing. I see him, I scratch my eyes, I him the now, is the simplest solution always the best solution? I would say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 95 times out of 100, there are occasions where you need some complicated solution. I have found on those occasions, the problem really was I didn't do a good job recording it. I recorded something in a rush. I didn't take time to record it well, so the sound is bad. Now I'm having to pull out all these tools to fix that. If you don't do that part, if you don't make that mistake, then you don't end up needing complicated tools in the mix. Now, just a quick caveat. I said the thing about side chaining. I understand that side chaining is a creative tool, especially in electronic music where there's a synth going bzzz, and there's a kick drum going boom. Boom, boom, and you can side chain the two. So now the synth goes. Bzz, 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 bzz. To me, that's a production thing more than it is a mixing thing. And I understand we can side chain and all. if you want to go side chain, great. Someone might have said, "Hey, Joe, what you should do is side chain this guitar part off of some other thing, so that when that happens, it turns it." I just needed to do that one EQ move. That's all it needed. I didn't need your complicated solution. I just needed the simplest, best solution. This will save you tons of time on your mixes and tons of frustration. And you're, you'll find that you finish a mix. I mean, check out this is my mix. I mean, check out how many plugins I have on here. Not that many. Most tracks have. I'd say half the tracks don't have anything on them. And then the ones that have the most, this snare drum has three plugins on it. Um, everything else has one or two. Um, now, some of them are multi plugins, right? Like the, um, like the Fat Channel. It has, it has EQ and compression, which I'm not using the compression in that instance. Um, my plugin, Gildervox, has a bunch of stuff in it. So, to be fair, it's, there's more going on there. Um, but man, if you can embrace this idea of simplicity, I promise you your mixes will come together faster and they will sound better. Because one of the biggest things that plagues us as mix engineers um, is that we tend to do too much to the track. Biggest crit criticism, if I could give a big generalization of the thousands of mixes I've critiqued over the last decade and a half, the, the kind of one thing that applies to all of them generally when the mix isn't really working is that I'm hearing the mix rather than hearing the song. And how, how is that happening? Because typically the person is doing too much. They feel compelled to do a bunch to the tracks. Maybe that's because the tracks don't sound good to begin with. Let's fix that. Or maybe it's because they just don't know how to just relax and just let the song speak. That's my encouragement to you today. All right. My name is Joe Gilder. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.